Two weeks. Two whole weeks. I was called by my brother to come to Spain for two weeks. It's a difficult call, Spain. He was getting married, and because, you know, we couldn't really afford to take the whole family, I needed to make the really tough decision that it should only be me who goes. He was my blood after all. So I went for two weeks, and I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to Spain, I may as well pop into London. <laughs> um, but it was a tough decision to also do that, because that added the days to have an incredible European experience. <laughs> it was wonderful for me. Uh, memories I will never forget. My wife also had memories she will never forget at home. <laughs> in the same old house with our same two children. <laughs> Little Jasper, too, into everything. <laughs> Sounds playful, but when you're experiencing it every day, it's really annoying. <laughs> Oscar, who was four, almost five, he was pretty good until the gastro hit at home. And I don't know if you've experienced a whole family vomiting, amongst other things, together. It's a little bit different to the communion we will be having today together, but an experience nonetheless. So when I was overseas, I was acutely aware of one fact. I could not come home empty-handed not just for my children, that was easy. And for the men in the room, if you've had to buy an actual gift for your girlfriend or for your wife, not a gift voucher, an actual gift, <laughs> or not an experience that you too can enjoy, but an actual gift, <laughs> you will know that is an incredible amount of pressure. I learned one thing on this trip. I have a gift for buying gifts for Davina. Hallelujah. Amen? Uh, I, I, that is a gift, if you ask me. And uh, her favorite shop is based in Barcelona, or as they say there, Barcelona. And Zara. Now, for all you Sydney people, and I'm sure it's in Melbourne, you'll go, wow, yeah, that's just like down the street from me. Well, we live in Perth. And <laughs> McDonald's came last year. Um, so I think Zara will probably be there for the next maybe GC session, um, if we're lucky. I lie, Zara is actually there now. That would have been handy at the time, but no. So there I was in the home of Zara, Barcelona, and uh, I had to go in and choose something because that is the only thing that would satisfy knowing what I knew Davina was going through. My postcard was not going to be enough <laughs> anymore. As an aside, I will say this, it is very difficult to have sympathy when you are sitting on the Spanish coastline <laughs> looking out at the sunset enjoying the view and yet that sounds so terrible. It is difficult to sympathize, but there I was in this awful predicament in my European adventure. So there I was in Zara, and all of a sudden as I enter, it's like this veil or this cloud comes over me, and I can't make any decisions anymore. And I'm just wandering around, and I think I did about 10 circles, upstairs, downstairs, and just circling, not knowing what to do, and then clarity comes. In the name of Jesus, clarity came to me, and this beautiful jacket was there, and I thought, do you know what? That is it. That's the jacket. I bought the jacket, and I got home, and I almost, you know like the, uh, the gods of the Old Testament that aren't real? I almost offered it up to her <laughs> as a peace offering, knowing what she had experienced, trying to downplay all the amazing experiences I have. Can I see the photos? No. <laughs> you don't want to see those. Um, they're really fun. And 
So I offered up this gift to her, barely being able to look her in the eye, hoping it will be accepted. She takes the jacket and she tries it on and what do you think happened? Perfect. I gave that away, didn't I? Because I said I had a gift for buying gifts. It was perfect. She loved it. But it was late at night and we kind of hung it over uh, this chair in our living room uh, and we went to bed. I got up the next morning. Daddy's on duty. <laughs> no rest for the wicked. Anyway, jet lag from my European adventure. Dad's on duty with the kids and I'm doing something really important but not paying attention. And I see there's this green mark all the way down. Did I say the jacket was white? <laughs> yeah. The jacket was white. There's this green, thick mark. Not a pencil mark. Like a giant, thick pen. And it turns out it was a fabric pen. I'd never heard of a fabric pen. I never even knew it existed in my home. And I was thinking, fabric pen, does that mean it comes off easier on fabric? <laughs> no, it means it never comes off fabric. And I became angry because my gift was accepted and now it was ruined. By my two-year-old Jasper, who is into everything, who found a fabric pen that I never knew existed until that point in time. And not only did he find it, but the one thing in the entire house he thought would be nice to colour in <laughs> was the white jacket sitting on the back of a chair. That cheeky monkey. <laughs> so I got down and had a calm, rational discussion. I was absolutely furious with him and I took him aside. I was absolutely furious because this gift had brought me suffering and anxiety. It was accepted and now he had taken it away from me. Yes, he was too, but he had taken it away. <laughs> and so, what he does though, when he knows he's in trouble, he does this, and he goes, cuddle, 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 cuddle. <laughs> we haven't even spoken about it yet. And he comes, you know, he's, he's this thing that kind of stomps around, he's like an animal, right? But all of a sudden he finds his twinkle toes and he says, cuddle, 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 cuddle. And I said to him, no cuddles. We need to have a discussion about this. Because before you and me can move on, child in nappy, you need to understand something. You need to understand that before we can move on in our relationship now, we need reconciliation. And then we cuddle. And so we talked about it because I needed him to know to go and sin no more. <laughs> you know? You cannot do this ever again. Now the real beauty in the story is that it was behind this little collar bit. And so when you kind of put it down, you can't even see it. Amen? But before you can move on in any relationship, there must be reconciliation. Sometimes we forget that we've been wronged or something happens and then, you know, we get distracted and we come back and we try and just make, move forward without actually dealing with what happened. You know, oh, that was, you know, that was yesterday or that was, that was two weeks ago. Everything's fine, but it's not fine because it gets brought up again and again and again until you actually deal with it and you become reconciled to one another. We're going to be entering into communion together as a community. But before we can do that, we need to be reconciled with one another and we need to be reconciled with God. Because communion is not something that we merely do Communion is not something that we just appreciate like a nice painting and say, well, that's nice. Communion is not something 
uh, you know, when you can read your Bible and marvel at Jesus' words and we just marvel at them. Communion is more than that. It is not just being so impressed by the miracles he performed. Communion is different. Communion is something to be part of, that we are involved in, that we are invited into. And in a short while, I'll be inviting you into that moment. And after, once we do this, um, I'm reminded of uh, the Last Supper. Although I don't know why they call it the Last Supper, because really it was the first supper. But what was happening before that? We read it in Matthew 26, 17 to 19. I'll read it for you. On the day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want to make preparations for you to eat Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him. I like that bit. Just go into the city to a certain man. You will know who he is. To a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. They were not preparing for a last supper. They were preparing for Passover. Let's take a quick look. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to the first Passover, Exodus 12. Love this story. Love the fact that we've been in the book of Exodus before we come to this point. Thank you, Delroy. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat, roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire. Heads, legs, and inner parts. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. In other words, eat it all. Leave nothing left on the table. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you and your houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord a lasting ordinance. They weren't preparing for a last supper, they were preparing for Passover, and yet the two meals become interlinked and intertwined forever. Not just because of the unblemished lamb, perfectly symbolized by Christ, the perfect lamb that was slain for us, his broken body for us, not just because of the blood that the Hebrews put over their doorposts as a sign to save their firstborn when Jesus symbolically became and spilled his blood so that we could also be saved. 
There is another element of Passover which I want us to consider before our communion, and that is of the bitter herbs. You'll see on your plate in front of you, there's like a green leaf with something on it. It's horseradish. I haven't tasted it. But this is what they now commonly use with a bit of spice as their bitter herbs at Passover. Why bitter herbs? It sounds bitter. The bitter herbs act as a reminder to remember the sorrow, as a reminder of their slavery, and a reminder that in that situation of sorrow and slavery, they were in need of saving. And as they eat the bitter herbs, the bitterness can be tasted that would sometimes bring tears to their eyes so that they could remember and feel as one with their ancestors who cried in their moments of sorrow and slavery. So before we take communion, before we linger on Christ's sacrifice, let us remind ourselves of the situation we find ourselves in. As 1 Corinthians 11, 28 says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For in Christ, we find ourselves part of the redemption story, thousands of years old. So just as the bitter herbs acted as a reminder for the Hebrew people's sorrow and their slavery, so we need to need to examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup to acknowledge our own sorrow, to be conscious of our own slavery. So what are the sorrows that need to be brought before God today, before we enter communion? The sorrow of broken relationships, the sorrow of seeing a loved one in their ailing health or someone pass away, or maybe it's just the sorrow of a life that didn't go to plan, a life that just isn't fair yet. The sorrow of a lost child at pregnancy. Or for me, the people who struggle in silence and who are here and have people to their left and to their right who have no idea of their silent struggle. Of trying to make ends meet, of debt, depression, Or the sorrow of seeing a church in anguish and needing to be reconciled so that we can come and once again be one. Let us examine our sorrows and bring it before God. And what about our slavery? What are we a slave to? I'm not a slave, I hear you say. One says, I'm a slave to Christ. What else? Are you a slave to? What is it that draws you away from worship? You see, do you know why God called his people out of Egypt? Seven times amidst the ten plagues, Moses says to Pharaoh this, Let my people go, so that what? They may worship me. What draws you away from worship? What distracts you from worshipping God? What brings disruption and distraction in your home? Are you a slave to your work? Does it create separation for you, your family, from God? Are you a slave to your study? Whatever it is that owns you, even if it's a small piece that owns you. Let us examine ourselves and bring our sorrow and those things we are a slave to, to Christ. 
So as we do this, and there's, I think there's only one or two leaves there, for those who are willing, I want you to take some of those bitter herbs. I want you to break it off, and I want you to put it in your mouth and chew on it and taste the bitterness of your situation. Let's take a moment to do that now. I don't do this to beat ourselves up. I don't do this so we can have a pity party at our table. So that we beat ourselves down and feel worthless. That's not the point. The point is that to truly move forward in our relationship with one another, to move forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to know that we need him. We need to remind ourselves of our actual situation so that we can recognize and acknowledge that I needed his body to be broken, that I need to drink from this cup because I need a savior. We all look pretty good here, especially Melbourneites, great coats. Looks like we got it all together. And yet we're not. We're not all together. The good news is that we have a Savior. So we can truly experience the joy of turning our sorrows into dancing. The joy of turning our slavery and struggle into freedom. The good news is we have a Savior who is enacting his very own exodus in our own life who is providing a way out of our sorrow, who is providing a way out of our slavery, and it is embodied not in a command, but in a person. And so it is now as we bring ourselves fully, that we bring ourselves wholly to communion. That those things maybe we left at the door or that we left at home are here and we bring ourselves, our whole selves, to communion so that we can be truly reconciled with one another and with God the Father. So I'm going to take you through this now, uh, a really basic process whereby I will do a reading. I will give a prayer of thanks. We will take and eat or we will take and drink. But then I will leave a moment for you to pray either with one another or with yourself before we move on. The oil is for the blessing that is to come, just so you're aware. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite you to take your bread. 
Let us give thanks. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this bread, bread that is broken for us, like your body was broken for us. Now I invite you to take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this juice. Juice representing your blood spilled for us so that we may live and find freedom and joy in being once again reconciled with the Father. So I invite you to take this is my blood of the covenant. you now just to spend some time in prayer before we close with our blessing.